The Power Satellite by Roman Frederick Starzl. First published in Wonder Stories, Volume 4, Number 1, June 1932. Chapter 1. Anton Waite, special diplomatic representative of the terrestrial government, felt the subtle menace of it, that ghastly danger which threatened the peace of the entire solar system. He had arrived on the controversial little satellite of Goddard, Neptune's sole moon, on a supply ship only a few hours before. Now in the huge vaulted underground chamber where a thousand persons, a fifth of the satellite's entire population, dined leisurely, he looked around curiously. At his secluded little table, screened by one of the huge supporting pillars, Waite watched the scene, in many respects a cross-section of the interplanetary life of that advanced day. He saw terrestrials, brawny, efficient engineers, mine foremen, technical experts. Although their clothing, in these rest hours, was of excellent, iridescent fiber, it suggested in cut the union alls of their working hours. There were also Martians, descendants of Earth's colonies on the Red Planet, hawk-faced, usually handsome, with dark, curled hair, pink skin, in their native clothing that suggested military uniforms, and a sprinkling of Venusians, grave, pale as alabaster, the men in long, flowing robes. Only the women of all three racial branches were similarly gowned, wearing long, brightly colored drapery and flitting about like animated jewels. Music from a concealed source filled the hall and a play of living colors over the walls, the ceiling and the white stone floor completed the harmony. Waite's rugged, young and not unhandsome face was grave as he thought that only in men's hearts there was no harmony, but rankling suspicion. He was a splendid specimen of a terrestrial man, of slightly more than average stature. Even in repose, and more so when he moved, he suggested leashed force. He would need all he had, he thought, as he considered his difficult and dangerous mission. At this moment, he was conscious of a faint perfume, and a voice back of his chair spoke. Please, pretend you know me. With a start, Waite looked up at the girl. She was, he saw, a Martian of rare beauty, her features, with all their imperiousness, were small and feminine. Like all Martians, she was a little smaller than a terrestrial of her sex. The soft, rich material of her clothing clung to a body that was slim and yet exquisitely rounded. Her pink arms and legs were partially bared, and her feet were thrust into tiny slippers that concealed only her toes, revealing high arched insteps. A singer or dancer, Waite decided, come to this remote port under the inducement of a high salary. Call me Glida, the girl continued breathlessly, sitting down on a stool which she drew to the table. Talk to me, I'm in a very bad mess. Glad to do that, Wait grinned. Shall I order some Venus pears for you? Please, and Wait gave the order through the table microphone. In a moment, the fruit appeared through an opening in the table's center, and the girl began to eat. Wait watched her speculatively. He wondered if she were the spy of some hostile power. If so, she had lost no time. Her approach, though not exactly new, was certainly effective. Setting small, white teeth into the fruit, Glida smiled. Her eyes, beneath their long lashes, were a brilliant amethystine green. Her head was small, well-shaped, and her dark, curled hair was held in place by an inexpensive fillet of gold, long since artificially produced by the atomic process and therefore cheap. He decided that he might like this girl, even if she were a spy. Waite had walked perilous paths before and had unmasked many a pitfall, but never had an adversary been so attractive so he smiled at her. She responded, but there was a trace of pathos in that response, and the look in her eyes was that of a hunted creature. You have just come on the supply ship from Earth? She asked. How do you know that? I heard him say so, Snade. Snade, the Martian authorized receiver. I hate him. Snade told you about me. You hate Snade? That doesn't make much sense. It does. Don't look now. I'll tell you where he is, under the second sun disk. Take this. From a small pouch at her girdle, she took a then familiar toy, a curved quartz rod with lenticular ends. By looking into one of the ends, due to a peculiar property of quartz, one could observe what was going on behind one's back. Waite held the fragile bit of glass to his eye, and scanned the room around him, as with a periscope. He located Snade at once, watched him with interest. The Martian was rather typical of the ruling class of that planet when they begin to go to seed. His skin was red, verging on purple instead of a healthy pink. 
His body was gross, forced into a tunic of military cut, which was meant for a much slimmer man. His thick black hair was cut short, standing up stiffly. His large, hooked nose, deep-set eyes, and full lower lip all betrayed unscrupulousness, lust for power, impatience with opposition. And now Snade was obviously in a black mood. He seems pretty sore about something, Waite remarked, handing back the quartz. So he's the authorized receiver? Yes, and I hate him, Glida declared vehemently. He, well, he wants me. Ever since they brought me here, he has wanted me, and now he says he will wait no longer. Watching the flame and the shadows of fear in her eyes, Waite thought she was either a very good actress or she was telling the truth. But Miss Aglida, you could appeal to the factor. This may be a bit off civilized trails, but it's subject to law, the interplanetary statutes. Didn't you know that? Again, that hunted look. Yes, but I will have to trust you. You will help me if I tell you everything. Snade seems disturbed by your coming. A man whom Snade fears is one who could help me. It's this. Stop, Wait snapped. Don't say a word. There's a photo beam on you. Glida's fingers fluttered to her throat. Say nothing. Take your hands down. I want to see. There it was. On the slender column of her neck was a tiny speck of light, almost too small to be noticed. But both of them knew that it was the termination of a tiny beam transmitted by some spy in that room, and that a telescope with a photoelectric cell at its focus, was directed on that spot of light. The vibrations of Glida's throat quivering over that light beam would be easily heard by the eavesdroppers. We're in for it, Glida, if they heard much. We can't talk here. Come, let's get out. No, wait. Oh, he's coming. Have you ever been on Mars? Say you met me at the Montessor Theater. Snade was striding across the large open space at the center of the hall paying scant attention to the deferential greetings of acquaintances. He was coming toward them. Waite groaned inwardly. Knowing the Martian temperament, he expected a fight. Public attention would be directed to him, and he would immediately incur the enmity of a man who could be useful to him. But the Martian had evidently decided to avoid trouble. He bowed civilly, acknowledging the introduction. Glida told me, Mr. Waite, that she knew you on Mars. I heard that you had just arrived. That catalyte matter, I presume? Waite was taken aback. He did not miss the sharp scrutiny that accompanied Snade's formal politeness, nor the underlying note of triumph. It was natural that his arrival should be noted, but his purpose. That was disconcerting. You wonder how I know that? The Martian's lips drew back in a grin. My dear sir, what else would you be here for? The man who negotiated the Mercurian gum deal and a dozen other coups. I trust with your aid, we shall soon solve the mystery. And what a charming companion. He laid a soft red hand on Glida's arm, and she shrank perceptibly, though she smiled. I confess, sir, I envy you, Snade went on with elaborate affability. Women are not ordinarily indifferent to me, but... He looked rueful, bowed, and turned to stride away. Glida shivered. I'm afraid, let's go outside. You must do something for me. After that, ask anything of me. But you must help, will you? Looking into her face, Waite did something he would have found hard to justify. I will help you. Come outside. Like all human habitations on Goddard, the Great Hall had been cut in the solid rock far beneath the surface of the satellite. For, although Goddard has a thin atmosphere, it is so deficient in oxygen that no human being could live in it. The little interplanetary mining colony lived, therefore, in a honeycomb-like structure, far underground and the atmosphere was artificially maintained. Waite and the girl found themselves in one of the main galleries, which were wide and well-lighted. Where can we talk? Not here, Glida murmured, this way. She led him a distance of several hundred yards, then up a lateral gallery. Here there were fewer people. They turned again, and it seemed as if they had suddenly been transported into some terrestrial park at twilight. It was a real park, deep down in the bowels of Goddard, a huge vaulted room in which familiar terrestrial vegetation grew under favorable conditions. The great actinic lights had been turned off, and a faint perfume of soil and growing flowers filled the air. Glida led the way to a bench, and Waite sat down beside her. As he did so, several figures entered the park. Lovers, perhaps? Just then it was credible. But a moment later, there was a crunching of feet on gravel close by, and some instinct made Waite whirl and leap to one side. It was too late. 
Shadows were all around them. Glida cried out and half rose to her feet. Something thudded against Waite's head. He was in the midst of a swirl of figures, a fighting, panting men. Waite felt for the ray tube in its clip at his belt, but it was gone. That woman, he exclaimed angrily to himself as he struggled against unconsciousness. What a fool to fall for that old trick. He landed a blow and was rewarded by a grunt of pain. His elbows thumped solidly against something. Let him have it, don't let him call, came a snarl at his ear. A heavy blow almost paralyzed his shoulder. It had barely missed his head. Weight was getting tired fast, and his head never had entirely cleared. In the dim light, he could not see his attackers, nor how many of them there were. A blinding flood of pain as something struck his head again, and Weight felt his knees give under him. Finish him quick, howled the unknown. And Weight, still fighting automatically, was nearly past caring. Then it seemed to him that the fury of conflict redoubled, and lying neglected on the ground, he was no longer conscious of blows raining upon him. At last, blackness engulfed him, and he knew nothing at all. When Waite returned to consciousness and suffering, he saw that he was in a small, oblong office, hewn, like everything else in the city of Goddard, out of solid rock. The walls were hung with astronomical charts and tables. Waite was lying on a cot, and from where he lay he could see, still blurred and uncertain, the green, red and white comet brassard of the IFP, the Interplanetary Flying Police. With a groan of gratitude and pain, he sank back and closed his eyes. His groan aroused someone. There were heavy footsteps that came from an adjoining room and stopped beside Waite's bed. Be glad you can groan, said a hearty voice with a laugh in it. That bop on the head nearly split your skull. Wait looked for the speaker. Slowly, the blurry outlines of a genial full face came into the field of vision. A pleasant face under a crop of stiff, sandy hair, topped by a little round skull cap of woven metal, the uniform headgear of the IFP. The officer was dressed in regular uniform, except that he did not have on the heavy service belt with its load of instruments and weapons. Wait managed a wry grin. Knock me again, fellow, he said, his tongue thick and clumsy in his mouth. I got taken in by an old and easy trick. If you hadn't come along, I'd be just a pile of dust in some refuse burner. It was you, wasn't it? How many of you were there? Just me and Belts, he shouted. Hey, Belts, drop them things and come in here for a minute. Belts came in a moment. He was smaller, slighter than his companion, whose name was Hackett. He had dark hair and a thin, studious face. In one sunburnt hand, he was holding the tiny coils and lenses out of a ray tube, which he had been checking over. He smiled warmly. Glad to see you coming around, Mr. Waite, he said. It was just luck that we came along during the fight. Only sorry we couldn't save the girl. Save the girl? What do you mean? Why, Belt said, they weren't hurting the girl, just holding her. So Hackett and I piled into the fight around you. We used our knobbed clubs and soon cleared a little room. Then the others grabbed the girl and beat it. Relief, gratitude, and then doubt assailed Wait. He had assumed that Glida had acted as decoy for Snade or for some other plotters who did not care to have the catalyte matter investigated. Wait was mildly astonished that it should matter to him whether or not Glida were absolved from treachery. But immediately a new fear tortured him. Glida was in the hands of his enemies. Her plight might be serious. With stakes of interplanetary importance depending on his catalyte mission, Waite could not deviate from his duty in order to search for the girl. And at the same time, he did not dare to call on the local authorities for help. They might be aligned with his enemies. There was one crumb of encouragement. If Snade had been concerned in that attack, then her position was not entirely hopeless. Snade would protect her against everyone but himself. Waite groaned again as he sat up and dropped his feet to the floor. You men from the Earth headquarters, he asked. From Denver, Hackett replied. You know, of course, that the IFP is really divided into three branches that cooperate. But ordinarily, the men from each planet always work together. And lucky for me, Waite exclaimed, gingerly feeling his scalp. And now I wonder if I can count on a little help from you unofficially, of course. And I'm gonna make a few things clear to you. I don't much like the idea of playing a lone hand when all my opponents are tipped off in advance. Now tell me this, do you know what I'm here for? 
Well, Hackett said uncertainly, I heard down at the mines that you were sent here to check up on the catalyte shortage. Wait grimaced, and they told me at Cape Town that my investigation must be made in the greatest secrecy. He limped to the table and picked up a tiny cylinder out of Belt's ray tube that the latter had laid down. Unscrewing the cap, he poured out a few grains of grayish powder into the palm of one hand. It felt warm, as though possessed of a life of its own. Catalyte, he exclaimed, fixing his eyes on the little heap in his palm. The very life of modern civilization. Without it, no rocket ship could ply the space lanes. No ray weapon could function. The stuff that changes iron into platinum or lead into gold. Look at it, men. Atoms that peel electrons as easily as you take off your undershirt. The race that has the catalyte has power. The one that has none is at the other's mercy. Carefully, he put the potent element back into its capsule, which was an effective insulator and capable of protecting the user against burns. We're anxious to help, Belt said quietly. We'll have to work very smoothly, Waite continued. Naturally, all three of the owning planets are very touchy about this. Goddard, this one mine, is the solar system's only source of catalyte. According to the treaty, each planet is entitled to an equal share. Anything smacking of interference, anything like the intervention of force, would mean war. Yet the fact remains that the output of catalyte has dropped, though as much ore as ever is delivered to the refinery. Someone is getting that missing catalyte. It isn't Earth. Could it be Mars? Could it be Venus? Each suspects the other, and all are only awaiting some suspicious movement, some tactless word. The human race is still pretty savage, men. Unless we can find out who's getting that catalyte and return it for an honest division, there'll be war. The other two nodded grimly. Yes, contributed Belts. And there's another angle. Somebody wants you to fail. Now you lie down, Mr. Waite, and get some sleep. We'll see to it nobody slips a knife into you. And when you're ready to start, we'll sort of keep an eye on you. Chapter 2, Into the Fire. The rare and indispensable element, catalyte, had been created millions of years before the first faint premonition of life stirred the primeval terrestrial ooze. In fact, Earth itself was still only a swirl of vapor. Flaming gases were thrown off by the sun, and one vortex formed the beginning of what was later the planet Neptune. Whirling, that incandescent mass threw off a part of itself, and in the following ages, that became the satellite. And when that satellite condensed into a sphere of solid matter, some 3,000 miles in diameter, there was in the dull shell a fabulously rich heart of catalyte, more powerful than even radium in breaking down the atomic structure of elements. Upon its discovery, it had immediately replaced the dwindling supply of radium for that purpose. By miracles of diplomacy, an interplanetary treaty had been effected, providing that the only known vein be jointly worked by a commission representing Earth and its colonies, Mars and Venus. After two terrestrial days, standard throughout the solar system except on Mars, Waite had recovered sufficiently from his beating to be able to leave his newfound friends. Because secrecy was futile, he determined to present himself immediately at the mine. As he came into this closely guarded zone, he passed through several lines of guards and finally was asked to wait before a heavily barred door. This, he knew, gave access to the impregnable citadel deep within the rocky shell of Goddard. The surface outcroppings had long ago been covered over with a thick and adamantine shell of concrete, and there was now only one way to either the honeycomb body of the ore, the refinery where the pure catalyte was extracted, or the adjoining weighing room where the pure product was delivered to be jealously divided up among the representatives of the three planets. Get up and stand before the visor, a disembodied voice commanded. Waite did so, held up his credentials to the whirring scanning disk. All right, come on, said the voice, and the great bolts moved back silently. The heavy door opened, closing again very promptly as soon as Waite had passed through. Factor Lyle himself awaited the Earthman. The Factor himself was a terrestrial, though he had spent many years on Goddard. He was tall and lanky. His thick white hair fell away from hollowed temples. The long strain under which he had labored was telling on him. He heard Waite's story, not commenting until it was finished. That's just another proof of something pretty deep and serious back of it all, he said. 
Some power is trying to precipitate a crisis. Anything for a pretext, that's historical, to seize the mine. And the power that has control of the catalyte has control of the color system. And whom? Wade asked, looking at the older man levelly. Do you suspect? Lyle laughed, then sighed. It's dangerous to jump at conclusions. It isn't hard to find a suspect. In fact, it's too easy, it's too clumsy to be true. You know, of course, whom I have in mind. Snade, Wade drawled. Lyle lifted his grizzled eyebrows. Pretty obvious, eh? If the Martian government wanted to start trouble, wouldn't it send somebody a little smoother than Snade? His nasty insinuations would tend to set both Earth and Venus against his own world. What will it get them? Do you think Snade knows where the missing catalyte could be? He couldn't have stolen it himself. It's handed over from the refinery in plain sight of the three world representatives. Each one takes his daily share and locks it into a private vault. It seems to me the right place to look for the leak is in the refinery then. Who is the chemist in charge? A Martian named Graxon. But the old fellow is absolutely reliable. He's been in the service for years. Besides, and that lets Graxon out, he delivers full weight for division. The catalyte is locked in the vaults. And when the vaults are opened, it has shrunk by one third, everyone's share alike. Yet the vaults are absolutely undamaged, the time locks unchanged. It's uncanny. It suggests fourth dimensional didos. Absurd, eh? Let's have a look, Waite said. A few minutes later, in the presence of the three authorized receivers, as required by law, Lyle unlocked the thick metal door to let Waite into the refinery. Snade was offensively polite. The terrestrial receiver was a man named Transon, middle-aged, dignified, and worried. The man from Venus was tall, pale, and calm, with a pointed gray beard. His lean body was draped in a gray robe. He said nothing, but his quiet eyes were ever on the alert. Graxon came forward. The chemist was nearing 60, although he was still sturdy. His hair was gray and abundant, his skin for a Martian unusually light. Large, dark, and anxious eyes looked out from under bushy brown brows. Wait, meet Graxon, Lyle said. Graxon's a virtual prisoner under contract not to leave this room for 10 years, and he has another year to go. Graxon, Waite has come from Earth to see if he can find out where the catalyte is going. He'll appreciate any help you can give him. It seemed to Waite that the chemist's deep-set eyes wavered. Then they became expressionless. I live here, sleep here, eat here. I get the concentrate, extract the catalyte, deliver it to these gentlemen. I don't know anything. Graxon's voice was vibrant, yet curiously veiled. To wait, his attitude was one of anxious defiance. What had this man to conceal? What had he to fear? How long have you been here? Nine terrestrial years. I have not been outside since I first came. My work with automatic machinery is easy. I have no visitors. I do my work. His mouth closed firmly, as if to shut off further speech. Wait prowled around the big room. It had been hewn out of the solid rock, and was filled with a wilderness of machinery and chemical equipment, the use of which Waite understood only vaguely. All openings, such as ventilators and chutes through which concentrates were dumped into the bins, were provided with complicated safeguards to prevent smuggling out of catalyte. Besides, always it came back to the incontrovertible fact. Graxon delivered the proper amount of catalyte. It disappeared after that. The others were already turning to go, and Waite was about to follow them when he was stopped by an unexpected sound. It was nothing but the muffled tapping of metal on metal, but it made him turn suddenly, every sense alert. For it had seemed to him for a moment that someone was tapping out a code somewhere. The next instant, an automatic control snapped, and a huge machine began triturating a fresh batch, drowning out the other sound. Graxon seemed not to have heard, but to wait, watching him covertly, it seemed that the old Martian's breathing was faster than normal. Graxon stood where he had been until they bolted the great door on him in his voluntary exile. That day's production was not to be delivered for several hours more, and as the others showed no disposition to leave, Waite stayed with them in the long, plain waiting room. As he listened to their conversation, he sought for some hint some key to plots and counterplots that were shaping the destinies of the human race. Behind these polite conversations were threats of war, of wholesale destruction, of whole planets blasted by death. 
but more and more Waite found his thoughts straying to Glida, the beautiful Martian girl. Had she betrayed him? It was quite possible that Snade, in murderous jealousy, had caused them to be trailed to the garden. And if jealousy had not been the motive, then there was the matter of the catalyte. Perhaps even Snade knew nothing of that attack. There were strange and powerful cross-currents of intrigue at work on Goddard. Snade's stiff military with hooded eyes discussed polite inanities. Watching him, Waite dismissed one question after another until one was left. What had happened to Glida? And then Snade, as if reading the younger man's thoughts, asked casually, And how did you get along with my compatriot, your old friend? He accentuated the words subtly, as with secret amusement. I did not get to talk long with her. Someone with reasons unknown to me tried to kill me. Who do you suppose it was? Snade smiled maliciously. Rival, probably. One or more of her lovers. Her sort, you know, must be on the watch for those things. Waite felt himself becoming angry. He felt the blood rising in his face. Glida was nothing to him, he told himself savagely. With an effort, he controlled his voice. He said clearly, From what she told me, you aren't in a position to say much about her personal habits, Snade. So, may I suggest that a gentleman would hardly be so free with his mouth? Nothing that Waite could have said would have infuriated the Martian more. He was of the sort, not unknown on Earth, who bolster up their waning prowess with women with sly hints and innuendos. Waite's blunt statement of his failure with Glida was like a blow. Snade's fist lashed out, but Waite, with certain pleasurable satisfaction, stepped aside. His return blow caught Snade's prominent nose, smashing it, and Snade tumbled ignominiously to the floor. He did not attempt to rise again, but the baleful glare of his eyes spoke death. Happier than he had been since he met Glida, Waite left the treasure citadel. One man, more or less, with a desire to kill him, was nothing to worry about. And he was still thinking about the muffled clanking he had heard in the laboratory. A clanking such as might be transmitted by a pipe for a long distance through a rock. A pipe that could be used to discharge the liquid catalyte concentrate into some secret cavern after refining to small bulk. What if that precious element did seem to disappear from the vaults? Waite knew that the most obvious things are sometimes the last to be discovered, and he was sure that once he found the key, the whole mystery would resolve into the utmost simplicity. The rest of that day, Waite spent prowling around the mine. It was so thoroughly policed that it seemed impossible for anyone to take any concentrate out of it, even if Graxon managed to return some of the refined product to some confederate. The next day, Waite determined, would be spent on the surface. That evening, tired but somewhat refreshed by a bath, Waite again entered the great dining hall. Although he did not wish to admit it to himself, he knew he was hoping to get a glimpse at the vivid little Martian girl, whom he could not keep out of his thoughts. When he did see her, the brilliant place became for him dark and cheerless. She was sitting at a table with Snade, and the latter was leaning toward her in a very proprietary way. Both of them caught sight of the terrestrial. Snade glared malignant triumph, but Glida's brilliant green eyes passed over Waite indifferently. She turned and smiled at Snade. It was a grimmer, quieter Anton Waite who donned the sausage-like spacesuit the next morning in the municipal airlock. He felt at his belt to make sure the borrowed ray tube was in place, turned on the oxygen, and stopped before a piece of apparatus, an ancient device. It was nothing but a glass jar through the neck of which projected a rod with a round metal ball at the end. At the bottom end of the rod, inside the jar, were two limp pieces of gold leaf hanging together, an electroscope, one of the few scientific instruments that had survived unchanged through the ages. Waite tested it to make sure that the protective sheathing of his ray tube would prevent its tiny storage charge from affecting the instrument. Reversing the airlock valves, he walked out upon the surface of Goddard. It was a weird landscape, judged by terrestrial standards, utterly bare, a scene of complete desolation on every side. The far distant sun was small, yellow, weak. Though it was then at its zenith, its light was flat, unreal. Much more impressive was Neptune, an enormous, nearly featureless moon glowing with soft, reflected light, then just half over the horizon. 
So enormous was it that it looked more like a gigantic domed mountain not far away than another heavenly body. The surface of Goddard was scoriac. No changes of weather had softened its harsh outlines. A succession of low, choppy cliffs stretched away on all sides, their bases white with what looked like snowdrifts. In reality, it was solidified carbon dioxide, so great was the cold. The airlock itself stood on a low, rounded mound about 400 feet in diameter, the vast concrete seal that covered the entire mine. High overhead on a spidery tower burned an intense white light, the marker for incoming spaceships. A half dozen ships, upright cylinders with conical tips, stood ranged nearby, each in its launching pit. They were deserted. Men did not ordinarily court the intense cold, the suffocating atmosphere. Methodically, Waite took a cloth and began to rub a small object that was wrapped in it. With this, he touched the metal ball of the electroscope. When the instrument was charged, the bits of gold leaf strained away from each other. Holding this carefully upright, Waite began a slow, systematic quartering process over the surrounding area, comprising a circle with a half-mile radius. After four hours, he was bathed in sweat, despite Goddard's relatively slight gravity. The electroscope had shown no marked loss of charge. And then, suddenly, it showed a very rapid leaking off of its charge, the leaves falling together every few minutes, a sure sign of catalyte nearby. When he finally found the crevice he was looking for, he realized that he might have passed it a dozen times, so well was it hidden. But when a minute later he found a footprint in a bank of carbon dioxide snow, he knew he had found a thieves' lair. He set the electroscope down and, ray tube ready, crept slowly down the steep slope of a rough path that led deep under the surface. He moved gingerly, for if a jagged rock should tear the spacesuit, death by asphyxiation would be inevitable. Soon he had to feel his way in complete darkness. And still it led downward. Once he tripped over a wire and waited fearfully. But nothing happened, and he went on. He had about decided that he was lost when his questing fingers came upon a metal door. It was a typical space lock circular with a hand wheel that could be operated from either inside or outside. Wait turned the wheel hurriedly. To his joy, it was not locked. If any of the conspirators were inside, they might think he was one of their number and could be surprised. In a moment, he was inside the cramped space within the lock. And then he was inside. Everything was in pitchy darkness. There was no sound in the helmet microphones. Ray tube ready, Wait crept forward, feeling for a light switch. Suddenly, a flexible metal rope came over his head, pinning his arms to his side. His unwieldy suit further hindered his movements, and although Wait fought with inspired fury, he was soon lying helplessly on the floor, with the weight of three or four men holding him down. A light disc on the ceiling glowed white, and someone roughly pulled Wait's helmet off. He was jerked to his feet, it's that damned Earthman, an exulting voice exclaimed. Wait knew it well. It was Snade's. Hardly expected such luck, Snade gloated. Dozens of men have tramped around overhead, and the one we want finally drops in. Who says luck isn't with me? Luck is a lady, and ladies like me. Wait, looking at the Martian's fierce, ugly face with its broken hawk nose, smiled, despite his predicament. Snade, still of injured vanity, snarled with hate. Before you die, look. He grasped Wait by the shoulder, whirling him roughly around. Standing a few feet away, her clear green eyes inscrutable, was Glida. She was dressed in a spacesuit, helmet off. Wait's open countenance twisted in a sardonic smile. He suppressed an absurd desire to bow mockingly. Burning words came to his mind, but did not pass his lips. At last he did say gently, At least this Glida was not your treachery. To his amazement, tears sprang into her eyes. She turned away. Besides Snade, there were two other men, Martians. One was horribly scarred by a ray burn about the face. The other was handsome, possessing the hard gloss that goes with living both richly and dangerously. All three were draped in the baggy fabrics of their deflated spacesuits, their helmets hanging at their backs. Triumph and amusement had left Snade, and he looked at Waite speculatively. How we get rid of him, men, he asked. Burn him, the scar-faced one returned promptly, his tube already in his hand. But Snade vetoed that. Won't do. He's got to die by accident. His body has to be found. We don't want an IFP inquiry. Tie him up till he freezes, the sleek Martian suggested. 
won't do either. This bolt is pretty able to take care of himself. He wouldn't freeze by accident, he pondered. Here's what. We take him out, rip his suit, make it look as if he slipped on a rock, tore it. Not bad? Well, sneered the sleek one. If he's so good, would he slip? We'll find a likely place. Wirtz, you stay here and guard the prisoner. Crete, you come with me. Chapter 3 Waits Discovery He of the scars tied a couple of more precautionary knots to hold their prisoner safe, while Snade and the other man slipped on their helmets. Still, he was not quite easy, keeping a vigilant eye on Wait as his compatriots passed into the airlock to the accompaniment of hissing valves. Glida came forward again. She looked at the trust prisoner coldly. Wirtz, those knots aren't tight enough. Better pull them up if you want to keep out of trouble. Wirtz did this, turning his back to her. As he did so, she knocked him unconscious with a wrench. Quick, she panted, working at the rope. You might have a chance. Tie him up. All this was the work of only a minute. Then, with Wirtz gagged and helpless on the floor, they faced each other. Glida smiled wistfully. Her remarkable green eyes were again suffused with tears. Her voice, which ordinarily was sonorous and sweet, trembled. We are both going to die soon, Mr. Waite, but we may die fighting. Must you despise me to the end? Hardly, he floundered. I know that circumstances, something, has put you in a bad light that you don't deserve. What is back of all this? He approached her. His thin metallic gauntlets touched hers, but through the rasp of metal, he felt the thrill of that contact. Instinctively, he put his arm around her, drawing the stiff material of her spacesuit into her waist. A wave of tenderness came over him. Never mind telling me, Glida. All I want to know, I realize you mean much to me. She smiled gallantly, but I must tell you, we will both be dead when Snade sees him. She touched the prostrate guard with her toe. Tell me this first, am I what men desire? You're all that any man could desire, Waite declared impulsively. With you, I would want nothing else. She smiled again, shaking her head. In that respect, then, you agree with our planetary secretary of finance. Masuin? Wait, like every other terrestrial, knew of Masuin, that figure of arrogant and almost legendary power on Mars. He was known to be the real government of that planet, directing the policies of elected officers, perennially reappointed by all parties. He had talked over an interplanetary photo-audio hookup. A man of indeterminate age, smooth, slender, paler than most Martians, with crafty, hooded eyes. A connoisseur of the arts and of women. Masuin? Wade asked. What about him? He saw me dance. He sent me an enormous basket of Venus orchids. The other girls were wild with envy over the honor and the implication. I knew what was coming. It did. A few days later, I received notice from the Eugenics Commission to report to government laboratory. They have power to conscript, you know, for experimental purposes. The Department of Biology is authorized by law to do that. Waite nodded. The object he had heard was to improve the race. I knew, Glida continued bitterly, what the Bureau would do. I wouldn't stay long in the laboratories. Instead, I'd be immediately referred to Mesuin, just another one of a long succession of experiments. Nevertheless, she spoke without heat. That infamous prostitution of an originally laudable institution was an old story throughout the inner orbits. I tried to escape, but the government agents soon got on my trail. I dared not try for the interplanetary ports, but fled from city to city. At last, one of the agents caught up with me. To my joy, he told me that he also was working for a private organization that was not in sympathy with the government. He said he would help me get away. I was touched by his humanity. I said I would never forget what they were doing for me. They never let me forget. This man obtained a forged passport for me and passage on a catalyte service ship as a cook. You smile, but I can cook. Once I was here, this man took me to Snade, and then I learned the reason for their kindness. Mr. Waite, did you look closely at the Martian they call Graxon? Graxon? Yes. What did he have to do with the plot? Graxon is my father. My mother died when I was a little girl. My father's life was one sacrifice after another for my career. He took the Goddard post, which few skilled chemists will accept, only because the money would put me through the best schools. I had not hoped to see him for another year, and I was overjoyed to learn that my mysterious friends were taking me to Goddard. 
I hoped I would have an even chance to visit my father. How simple I was not to realize I was putting myself and him in their power. We were soon to learn the price of my safety. A criminal syndicate, of which Snade is a member, plans to set up an outlaw government and to fortify Eros. To do this successfully requires a big supply of catalyte, and this is the only place where it can be had. Waite listened intently as the girl recited her amazing tale of a colossal interplanetary cabal. He himself had direct proof of its actuality. But one point was not clear. You said they forced your father to help them. But I came to the conclusion that your father must be innocent, despite some suspicious circumstances, because he delivered a full consignment of catalyte every day. It disappears after division. No, not real catalyte. A light slowly dawned upon the terrestrial. He was familiar, as the human race had already been in the dark ages of the 20th century, with the fact that radium, which was in some respects similar to the far more active catalyte, gave off emanations and he glimpsed a hint of the truth. Glida answered his unspoken question. Simple, isn't it? The catalyte emanation is a single, very volatile gas, catalyte A, so my father explained it to me. He found a way of solidifying this gas for a matter of a few hours. Then it again becomes gaseous and escapes or enters into compounds. Understand? Only he knew how to solidify the gas. He extracted it from its union with the ores, solidified it, weighed it in with the real catalyte. It looks pretty much like the real catalyte. Passes the radiation test too. But later in the safes, it simply evaporates. And the real catalyte? That went through some hidden pipe? Yes, complete, except for the final stage. The pipe was drilled upward from here. He pours the concentrate down the pipe. See those big vats back there? That's where the missing catalyte is. Waite looked at the great tanks in which reposed interplanetary power for a small group of criminals. The mystery was solved, ironic success. At that moment, he had attained his objective. At the moment that he had vindicated this girl who had for him such great attraction, at that moment, he was standing on the threshold of death, and the world would never know of his discoveries until it was too late. Now that Glida had laid bare her secret, some subtle change had come over her. She seemed still younger, and in some small degree, happy. She faced death with confidence and courage, strengthened by the presence of this stranger from Earth who believed her. She put up her lips to be kissed, and for some moments in that silent chamber, they forgot everything else. But stern realities pressed upon them. They will be back any moment, Glida said, rearranging her tumbled dark hair under the golden fillet. I had thought of surrendering to the government in order to save my father, but the first day he diverted the catalyte, he incurred the penalty of death. I am going to tell him now what is happening. Perhaps he can escape. She picked up the wrench with which she had felled the scar-faced Martian and began to tap on a pipe that came through the wall. In a moment, there were answering taps. He is ready to communicate. She swiftly tapped out her message, but there was no chance to get a reply. There was the sound of someone at the airlock, the click of a key being inserted. We will die fighting, Waite said quietly. We will have a better chance here than if we tried it out in the open with no shelter. They had taken his ray tube, but he had the one belonging to Wirtz. Glida stood close beside him. The expected opening of the airlocks did not come, only an indeterminate scraping noise. I forgot, Glida cried suddenly. They see we are free. They have a way of looking inside. I'm sorry, they will kill us without a fight. Say you love me. Wait clasped her in his arms. There was no time for the slow bolting on of helmets. Gas was already coming into the chamber. Snade was thorough, if nothing else. I love you, Glida, Waite said. The gas had a Swedish, unfamiliar odor, but its effect was immediate. He felt the perspiration starting from his forehead. Glida was swaying in his arms, her face a ghastly blob of white. The room, silent before, became peopled with phantom sounds, the beating of drums, the booming roar of rockets. The light seemed to become dazzling in its intensity. And then there was no sensation at all. They had misread Snade's intentions. He had no desire to kill Glida, and the gas was merely an anesthetic. Almost immediately, so it seemed to the Earthmen, consciousness came back with a rush. He was jerked to his feet by the sleek Martian Crete. Snade himself was supporting Glida. 
and Wirtz was lurching drunkenly about, his hideous face still showing the marks of the lines that had held his gag. The Martians did not speak. They busied themselves with bolting on their captives' helmets, and this took several minutes, after which, with a ray tube menacingly at his back, Waite began the long ascent to the surface. He could not see Glida, but the fact that she had also been helmeted indicated that she would follow. Would Snade dare to let her live? It was doubtful. Her knowledge was too dangerous. Old Graxon, too, would be murdered if he merely indicated the fact that he had received that last message. It seemed a pretty hopeless situation, but it is a human characteristic to hope against hope. Wait went ahead warily, trying to watch, by the faint reflections on the inside of his glass helmet when Snade should approach to deliver his blow. The expected knife stroke that would rend his spacesuit and deliver him to asphyxiation. They climbed up a ragged rock slope. The rock was cindery, porous. Great jagged pinnacles of it reared up on every side. The distant yellow sun threw hard shadows. High overhead was the intense pinpoint of the spaceport light, barely distinguishable from the ground, from the myriads of stars that burned steadily and coldly in the black firmament. Illogically, an ancient rune came to the Earthman's mind, and from a proud tower in the town, death looked gigantically down. There was no town here, and death was walking behind him. He could see the dim reflections in his helmet, and at the bottom of the slope, to one side, was the concrete top of the mine city. Its airlock was dark and deserted. They reached the side of a deep ravine, a sharp cleft in the rock, filled at the bottom with carbon dioxide drifts, and here the Martians attacked. They did not slash with a knife, as anticipated, but went about the business in a way that it would be more convincing at the inquest. Three bodies struck the Earthman and bore him down. They dragged him across the jagged, edged rocks until a fold of his suit caught. Waite's own struggles helped them. There was the sickening tear of tough fabrics and the soft whoosh of escaping air, followed by bitter cold as a puff of outside atmosphere penetrated through the rent. Sudden faintness overcame Waite. Although there was still oxygen in the suit, its pressure was very low. Dimly, he felt himself lifted. Then he had the impression of floating, only to land with a jarring thump. He could feel the hot wetness of blood flowing from nose and ears, and looking up with pain-dimmed eyes, he could see a patch of black sky, cut off on either side by rough rock walls. They had thrown him into the ravine, and only the fact of Goddard's low gravity had saved him from immediate death. Waite wondered what had happened to Glida. His condition was one of curious abstraction and inertia. He could no longer feel the cold at his back where the rent was. The skin there was numb with cold. But the oxygen regulator on the little tank over his shoulders was fluttering madly, trying to equalize the pressure. Perhaps a minute or two, then the tank would be empty. Delirious already, Waite saw the image of Glida above him. She was smiling through the glass of her helmet. Her green eyes were brilliant in the wan sunlight. He realized that she was no hallucination. She had climbed down to him. She rolled him on one side, grasped the folds of the torn suit. He could feel her fumbling, hindered by her gauntlets, but she succeeded. In a moment, the suit was filling and the valve fluttered more slowly. Rolling the jagged ends on themselves, Glida made a temporary but effective repair. And as the oxygen pressure rose, strength returned to the Earthman. Later, he might experience the horrors of the bends, but he was alive and life beckoned. Glida was talking, but something was wrong with the helmet phone. She put her helmet down so that it touched his, rubbing with a thin squeal of glass on glass. Can you hear me? Yes, Glida, what happened? Somebody in the city came to help us, among them a couple of IFP men and many others. They came through the lock just as Snade and his men threw you over. They're fighting now. Look, there was evidence of it. On all sides, tall pinnacles of rock towered into the sky. Every once in a while, one of them would show a small, glowing spot, the place of a heat ray's impact. That meant Snade and his men were at bay somewhere in that tumbled wilderness. Again, Glida's helmet clinked against weights. My father understood the message. He warned the police, but he may not have told them everything. Wait looked up into the lovely face, wistful, appealing. He motioned to her to touch helmets again. Are you asking me what I shall do? 
There was no need for an answer. Her eyes said, yes. If I live, Waite said with great distinctness, if I live, I will have to make a full and complete report to the interplanetary authorities. You will be sent to Earth under diplomatic immunity. But in diverting one single grain of the catalyte, he did not go on. The dumb anguish in her eyes cut him to the heart. They call it high treason, you understand? It is my duty if I live, don't you understand, dear? By saving my life, do you know what you're doing? It took courage to say that. Anton Waite was young. Life meant much to him. But he was so constituted that he would not purchase it from this girl for an implied promise that he could not keep. Her head went up. The hand that held together the rent trembled. Again, her pink skin became that marble whiteness so strange in Martians. She looked straight ahead as one who sees the end of hope. But the hand that formed the barrier between weight and death remained firmly where it was. Overhead, a man appeared on the rim of the rock. His was the attitude of a fugitive. Ray tube in hand, he faced back. Pale red beams flashed from the tube in his hand. He leaped the chasm with lightness, incongruous with so much bulk. Once more, he looked back, and as he did, his glance fell on the man and the girl at the bottom. Wait saw the hate distorted features of Snade, the Martian renegade. It was all like the frozen section of a dream, broken by the sudden bloom of a red spot on the pinnacle beside Snade's head. Then Waite saw the tube in Snade's hand swing around and downward with a deadly deliberateness. But Snade never loosed that beam. The slender red ray from the direction of the city struck his helmet. The tough glass instantly cracked into innumerable pieces, which flew under the internal pressure in a shimmering cloud in all directions. Snade slowly turned on his heels, his exposed head puffed and bleeding, and pitched headfirst into the ravine. His body landed in one of the white banks that so much resembled terrestrial snowdrifts. Glida once more put her helmet down. Her voice was resolute but infinitely sad. Farewell, Mr. Waite, the only man I ever loved. I found something on Goddard and lost it. That was happiness. I shall never see you again, Anton Waite. Her chin trembled, but she went on bravely. I shall go back to Mars, to Mesuin. What does it matter? She smiled whimsically, concealing her heartbreak. And if you're ever in Montesso, ask for me at the theater. I will most likely be back by that time. Ask for me and I'll get you a pass. The men from the city made their approach cautiously, alert for an ambush, and it took them some time before they found Glida and the terrestrial. They also found the bodies of Snade and his men, and it was a first-class sensation. Hackett and Belts insisted on taking weight to the IFP office for first aid treatment, and there he soon recovered sufficiently to think over his next move. Buck up, wait, Hackett urged genially. What's the matter with you? He applied tape to the medicated cotton dressing he had applied to the raw, frozen area on Waite's broad back. Here, you've done a job any of us would be insufferably proud of, and you mope around like a recruit who's cracked up his ship on a meteorite. What soured you? You'll never know, Waite said dejectedly. Woman was Belt Sage contribution. He looked at Waite with sympathy. I want you two with me when I arrest old Graxon, Waite said. Does he know? Of course he knows. He gave the warning to save his daughter. Men, I feel rotten about this thing. A few minutes later, they were in the restricted zones surrounding the refinery, and after complying with the formalities, Transon let them in to the old Martian chemist. Graxon seemed not unduly agitated, but Waite remembered Glida's stark courage, and he ascribed Graxon's calm to the same reason. Graxon, he said, I'm sorry, but I have to arrest you. For what? For diverting catalyte from the use of the use of three governments, for substituting solidified catalyte A. Graxon folded his arms over his stocky chest. A quizzical smile illuminated his square features, and his eyes twinkled. How do you know I diverted catalyte? It's down there in Snade's cave. That slop, those are the tailings. There may be half a grain in the whole mess. The irreducible minimum, enough to work a scope. Good enough for Snade and his ignorant crew. But what did you do with it? You didn't deliver it. You fooled the authorized representatives. What about it? Is there anything in the regulations fixing the quantity I must deliver? Read them as I did. I'm an absolute charge in this room and my only limitation is that I must deliver all the catalyte I finish. 
Well, it happens that I didn't finish it. I saved up a barrel of very rich concentrate that hasn't been ultimately refined. Perfectly legal, eh? He led them to a barrel that stood against one wall. It was like many others there, a thick lead alloy cylinder, such as were used during various processes in refining. Graxon tipped up the heavy cover, and a choking puff of ozone welled up out of the half-filled barrel. The officers looked inside. They saw a thick gray mud that seemed possessed of a life of its own. It's all there, and I'll deliver it someday when I get around to it, Graxon said. But why? Belts asked, trying to fit together the various pieces of the puzzle. Did you fool the authorized representatives? Because Snaid was one of them. I had to convince Snaid that the slop I was delivering to him was the real stuff, for her sake. What better way than to short the authorized receivers? Graxon's manner became less dourly amused, became sad. And yet it was for nothing. When Snaid is returned to Mars for trial, Misuin will hear where Glida is, and... Hadn't you heard? Wait interrupted. Snaid is dead? Glida will make her home on Earth. You too, sir, if you will accept a diplomatic passport. He did not mention what was uppermost in his mind, the fact that inexorable loyalties no longer stood between him and Glida. That thought he would cherish with jealous secrecy until he could share it very soon with Glida alone.